Welcome to another day of inventing with me, your host, Zio 205 iq How are you doing? Today is probably one of my more important days. Today we discuss something that has perplexed scientists for generations, and that is grand unification theory. Honestly, it is difficult to kind of comprehend, but once you see the simplicity of what it it, what it is, I just, I'm going to present it to you now without any further ado. So come with me on this little adventure. It'll be great. Come on. All right, so on the board here, we'll start at the top. Super spheres, grand unification theory, neutrino shattering effect allows for higher matter. And this is the neutron model basis. So if any of you are familiar probably with some charges of some neutrons, but what they actually look like and how they actually look. I say actually because that's what it is. It's... What, it's what I see, it's how I see it, it's just what it is. Okay, so let's look at this real quick. This is a neutron model for the universe, and that's very important because it appears that in the universe, everything kind of is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Turns out that if you were to destroy the entire universe, all of it, down to a single proton, and you turn that, that proton eventually, of course, because you got all these electrons by bouncing around from all the hadron flux that's left over from the, from the disintegration of the universe. But if you even had one neutron left, that neutron would have the vibrational energies within it and the structure to copy itself over and over and over and over and over, and over again from the leftovers. And that's essentially what we're looking at right here in, in the way of like the universe at large is a copy. And if we look at the universe, we can only see a small piece of it. And that's because there's gas and dust and distance. Those three things limit us from being able to see all of it. Now, I've kind of drawn it out here as well as I could. And this is uh, what we understand as the universe as it sits right now. Now, using the Sloan Sky Survey of the galaxies, we have surveyed an area of space about like that and that in that area of space we have a galaxy forming region and in this galaxy forming region the swath of galaxies looks something like that there are 14.7 trillion galaxies And that's, that's kind of important. So in our entire, oh, and, and we're right about, what is it, right about here, towards, towards uh, the outer curve. And in all of the observed data that we've seen, this is it. This is, it. This is like the whole, the whole universe that we know of is 14.7 trillion galaxies approximately. And and it looks kind of like this swath. So I was doing some research to see what could create that swath. And aside from the, the dual bar, which I'm sure you're all familiar from galaxies, this is a little bit different. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the structure of the neutron real quick. And I've gone over this in the videos, but I haven't put it all together for you yet. Now I have, and now I have the capability of showing it to you in high resolution so let's go ahead and look at it, and that way everybody can see that we're all on the same page. So we have our up quarks. Those are positive two-thirds. They have less mass than the down quark. About, uh, in, this, in this particular case, it's... <laughs> we'll just deal with the charge and, and the scale right now, okay? So what we're dealing with is the scale. So where do the up quarks come from in this sub-quantum soup? From what I can tell, uh, from a galactic standpoint, from, I should say, a universal standpoint, the universe started as a big cloud, one big cloud of interstellar hydrogen, just a huge one. And it, of course, was very cold. And it started to have Bose-Einstein convection, where it just started counter-rotating. You had these dual interlocking vortices, known as a Bose-Einstein condensate. And that was how it started in the sense of where did the motion come from? So you have these huge clouds. This one you can see is going that way. That one's going that way. And they spun up. And in the center, before all of this, this giant stuff, it formed up a liquid metallic core. 
all the stuff spun down. But there's some other things going on. You see these lines, and you're like, what are those lines of force, Zia? Well, check it out. Later on, after these two spheres form, and the, and the two spheres form from counter-rotation, once again, the gas clouds, I think, had play a big part of it, and they, they start out with one concentrated point, because, see, if you have a whole mess of hydrogen gas, this is something that, that I don't think that they've discovered yet, uh, and you make it eh, relatively cold, you can start bending the force of gravity with it. It's, it's like a bunch of little superconductive lenses once you get it cold enough and at the right pressure. Now, in this case, we had enough pressure and enough, enough cooling to where the two gas clouds formed a pinch point, a pinch point of space time, point of highest mass. Now, this could occur inside the cloud. So there's this massive cloud, that two clouds that, that go away in each direction and, and they're just coming down on this crunch point. But let's just deal with the grand unification model theory. So eventually you form a, a single sphere, liquid sphere, the liquid sphere separates into two liquid and semi-liquid cord spheres just like in the same configuration as this and then they begin they continue their counter rotational spin due to the influence of the funnel of the gas clouds that's actually what spins them up it's a physical force it's not like magic it's it's a physical force that spins them up and uh whew, that was just too bright for me and eventually you get the counter rotational spheres and once they, once they reach a solidity to their core, they begin transversely cooling the other sphere with dark energy, what we would consider neutrino energies, which make up a binding force. And this binding force is drawn into the gravity well of this system. This is a gravity well. There's shells of it that extend away. And they extend, radiate outwards into space. It's essentially like a big hole that everything falls into, and it just happens to run through these spheres. So we have uh, neutrinos, neutral energy neutrinos, and no, that's negative. neutral energy neutrinos. <laughs> and they pass through the superconductive lens of the solid metallic hydrogen. Now, how did solid metallic hydrogen get there? It's a process. It goes, you know, from liquid to slush to semi-metallic to metallic, and, and then, of course, uh, then it's still spinning, so you end up with this really cool focal point. Now, the focal point itself creates a dual jet, just like the same kind of thing we see in the galaxy. This is the opposite, though, I think. Even though this is a gravity well, so it might be drawing stuff in, it looks like stuff's coming out. Because that's, that's where, I mean, is, is all of our galaxies doomed to, to get sucked into the, uh, into the funnel, into the vortex? Or are they an effect of orbital on the event horizon of the said black hole? They're essentially surfing the wave. So you get a stream of things that are obviously getting pulled in and some stuff that's getting shoved out uh, from, from the event horizon. But this is the actual edge of that, edge of that funnel. So you get these, uh, our galaxies are s similar in, in that sense, they're riding on the edge of the wave, kind of like uh, one of those big coin funnels, you send the coin down, it just goes round and round and round. In this case, we have a balance between the orbital velocity and the, <laughs> the gravitational attraction going towards the middle. So in this case right here, this is, uh, like I said, this, this, this is a model that uh, shows pretty much everything. I mean, there's a lot of you out there who have enough intelligence to really see what this is in the sense of, you know, the process. You know, you got interstellar metallic hydrogen, or inter interstellar hydrogen, interstellar, or local, I should say, local hydrogen condensation into liquid slush metallic. Now the transverse binding cooling from phase-tuned local space neutrino energies and just dark energies. We're just going to stick with neutrinos because neutrinos, we can't prove any of the other dark stuff. I mean, there's just axions. They're, what, like 10 to the negative 47th, and they still didn't find them. So, or at least that's what they should be looking if they're not. And, you know, that's the, your, uh, your multiple, I think, that's where they should be looking. But anyways, uh, so they didn't find it with the axions. So let's just deal with it as, as we see it, which is uh, neutrinos for now because they're a carrier part, or at least a trace particle we can pick up and we can study. So, the neutrinos, or the neutrino-like energy, uh, which is fast as light and passes through normal matter, 
passes through the superconductive solid compressed space of the solid metallic hydrogen spheres. And in this case, we're, we're really looking at the fact that neutrinos, or sorry, neutrons should contain, I mean, the energy that's there, you're, you're, you would have to, you'd have to be able to like freeze time or something to be able to pull one of these up quarks apart real slow and look at its constitutes. We would see it as essentially pure energy, but of course that's not just all it is. So uh, It's made up of subquantum metallic hydrogen that has survived passage through a black hole. I mean, you've seen the other videos, you would know that when you take metallic hydrogen and you pass it through a black hole and it's in a solid state like this. Now, I've seen, this is a problem. As soon as you lose compression, metallic hydrogen goes back to gaseous state. So my theory was that it may be a hybrid. Uh, we've seen metallic hydrogen survive in silene chains after it's been induced, its formation has been induced by lasers. So with lasers or other forms of, of light, near light or as, as light, <laughs> like light compression, you could get metallic hydrogen to form in those, in those areas, in those states. So in this particular case, we're looking at most likely uh, something, either a hybrid compound, essentially an alloy of metallic hydrogen in, in a subspatial kind of manner. <laughs> and most likely it's, it's probably iron and uh, uh, metallic hydrogen. That's, that's the only thing I can think of that would survive that trip down there. And I say down there, but let's look at, let's look at what we're talking about. Now, monopoles like electrons. Now, on a, on a neutron, you get these uh, electrons that are stuck at the poles, the polar areas of, of the neutron. And that's uh, after it's, you know, proton, and then you use an electron beam, and boom, you get these, these neutrons that are in there. And that's because these electrons get stuck in this funnel. And this funnel is induced by two things. You have a charge vibration, but then you also have space. Space has this funnel-like object, a matter kind of thing going on there in it. And it is able to trap this electron or hold it right there. Now, whether it's the spin of the up quark that's making it as an attractive force across this plane, which may well be what we're looking at. But this is an interesting thing here, this, this funnel. And I mentioned this before when I was talking about, like, uh, phosphorus. Phosphorus is kind of funny like that. You can, that, that's a photovoltaic material that, that has these same types of things. Any, any material that's photovoltaic, you know, has the plus or minus uh, valence shell charge, will have these electrons that are trapped at polar regions. But phosphorus is especially cool because you can have compounds of phosphorus. You can have like P37, P7, you have all these different phosphorus compounds, P37, 27, you, know, you, you name it, there's a whole bunch of them out there. And they have these photon to photoelectron exchanging electrons trapped at the poles. And there's like a, like a butt end of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the field that sticks out and you have this funnel. And the approximate funnel size is, is about, well, the, the end that catches the photons is about 500 nanometers in diameter. So I know where to look for it. I know what to measure. It's just, you know, it appears that whatever this funnel is made of is not necessarily detectable by our electron-based, it's too small, it's too tiny. And it contains, constitutes, if this thing's sitting there, it's either by mass, so we could have we could have its mass, and by the charge, by the charge, and that's positive attraction to these. So the up quark probably might hold it there by mass, but this funnel holds it in place. I think it has to be there. It has to be there. There's there's this is a totally different energy. This this photon neutron energy or pho photon neutral energy is neutral. That's a neutral energy. And those those photons come down the funnel and add their mass to that electron, which means the structure and materials that an electron is made of are identical. 
to a photon. They're, they're just, there's just less of them in the photon in this particular case, or the spin is slightly different. Basically, the materials themselves, if we look at the, the sub-quantum materials that we're talking about, and, we're, and we're, when I say quantum, I mean you know, below the level. Of, of, of an upcorp. Upcorps are huge compared to the materials in these. In here, according to my calculations, you have, it, it is a monopole on the charge on the outside, right? It's, it's negative one, okay? But on the inside, it's almost like you've got a, a, a giant, you've got these strings of magnets, and one of the charges, let's just say south. Let's say south has a higher propensity uh, to be attracted or attracted or attractive by your gravitons and, and, and your binding, your strong binding forces. And what happens is you end up, because of that, that attractive nature of one particular pole, and we could say north, we could say south, say south. And in this particular case, I'd say, let's, let's just go with north. Let's just go with north. Let's say, let's say each one of these strings is a little string from our perspective, of like a whole mess, a whole bunch of the dark iron and or dark iron with metallic hydrogen composite spheres, but on a on a much smaller compressed subspatial scale to us. Like they're they're way smaller and they got shoved there by the compression of a black hole. So normal matter, when it passes through black holes, essentially they, it gets dehydrated and all of the electron flux on this level just gets thrown around and then the material itself, the nuclei, get broken down to... should, should be broken down to metallic hydrogen, but there's going to be some materials, and that's what I'm trying to say. These are hybrid. This is a hybrid material. It's not just one material. It's not just metallic hydrogen. It's not just dark iron. It's, it's going to be a hybrid of any material, including superconductive ones, that can form a magnetic field that exceeds the shearing properties when compressed of a black hole's event horizon and, and being able to be shoved into a subspatial layer that can support its continuing existence at that layer. Easy, huh? All right, cool. <laughs> and that's just to explain photovoltaics. So photons come in and get caught in this funnel. We don't know what this funnel is made of. I, I don't see any documentation stating this funnel is there. Uh, I don't know if they can test for it. I, I know, though, its diameter, its mean diameter at, at its opening is going to be 500 nanometers because that is the most, or at least in this particular case for phosphorus, it's going to be, what, five, 500, 514, something like that. And you can test that. That part you can test using photovoltaics, and that's, Einstein was really cool on that stuff. And he said a bunch of stuff about photovoltaics, but he was super interested in photovoltaics because he saw that effect, too. He saw something there, and he couldn't explain. He's like, hmm... <laughs> perplexing, you know, and in this particular case, yeah, it is very perplexing. I, I'm, I'm just, I just, I want, I want more study done in that direction because we're gonna, we're gonna learn stuff, we're gonna study stuff that has not been clarified by anybody or anything. So, in this particular case, we got a 500 nanometer or or whatever frequency of light that particular photovoltaic absorbs and converts to photoelectrons best. So basically got photons that come in, fall down the funnel, uh, hit and combine with the negative electron, and then, the, the, then this, this, uh, this cavity, I think it's a cavity, at the base of the funnel holds that, that, uh, that electron, and it, it just kind of, the electron gets too big, too massive, and it either it spins apart, and then that chunk of now photoelectron get shot out. And it may be a, a division thing where the pocket itself divides the electron, but most likely it's, you know, charge and spin. We had a, a bunch of same type energy and materials to essentially a fuzzy little, looks like a little fuzzy sea urchin. <laughs> but of course it's, it's all locked together. And that's, that, that explained the monopole anyway. So you would have a propensity of one of the poles, uh, let's say north, uh, to be slightly more massive or more interactive with the graviton and it would end up forming a core where all of the north ends of the strands would all kind of come in contact with each other. Or, or not, they would they would be attracted to each other, but they wouldn't actually come in contact because north-north, you know. It would just it would have like a hollow core that you could take these little strings and and they, they would be able to insert and, and orbit. The, these strings would be able to orbit that core, but they wouldn't be able to uh, to touch. And then of course that means that, you know, all this material. Now, let's, let's look at uh, what's going on here in, in the upcorp itself. Now, 
you have a down cork. Now the down cork is a little bit different. Uh, it has uh, more mass than the uh, than the up corks and has a different charge too. So in in the case of a, of a neutron model, you have a down cork, which is this area here, and we know it's more massive, but we don't know why. And it may be just simply because that conglomerate material is is material that's in flux it's in motion it's being converted from one <laughs> one sub universe up into ours or, or if that's when you look at it and that's essentially what we're seeing here too in, in the way of our galaxy swaths these galaxies are coming from something they're coming from somewhere and the materials that are used to construct them in this case hydrogen gas is all you need all you need is hydrogen gas and of course electrons and you're going to get that from photons. Photon energies and electron energies coexist. They they combine. They mingle. They they that that's and and what's cool about that? And I'll go into that grand unification theory. We haven't even discovered yet how to make big electrons. And I think you could, it, with the right trap, you could probably add the right photons to the right electron and the right trap, and you could literally grow the electron. I don't know why you'd want to, but you could. Perhaps you could tap it for energy because you could shave it. You could shave like electrons off of it. You could store them and then shave them. So that could be like some future energy storage system that goes way beyond chemical. Because, you know, you're talking about electron density. I mean, imagine an electron that's the size of a baseball. I mean, that's, that's the, the amount of energy there is, is insane. <laughs> that's so much energy. <laughs> and, and it would, you know, it'd be massive too, but you could tap that thing for all kinds of cool energy project. So um, when polar electrons are lost, one forms an equatorial area. That's something we know about neutrons. When they decay, they decay immediately into protons. And there's there's uh, electron neutrino that shoots off that way and something that shoots off that way. So anyways, uh, here it is, super spheres. Uh, I could talk about it all day. I would love to talk about it all day, but I don't have the, uh, the, the interacting. I don't, I don't have like the... Other than YouTube, I mean, YouTube is, is like the only place that you can really go to do this. Uh, you know, Vimo, it costs money. And, and colleges' schedules are always full. They're always full. They, uh, they have their own curriculum, their own books, and their own beliefs. And they believe a lot of things that other people won't. And, and some people will. I mean, you get the majority of uh, physics and science that are coming out of these, these same books. And I've read them. And what I see eventually is you get this dark area, this area where the books don't match up, where the statements don't match up. And this one matches up to known structures, known reactions. It is the core to a grand unification theory, a real one, to where the entire universe could literally be created from a single proton pattern. And that, that's, that's grand unification. You could start with, a, with just hydrogen gas. And, and that's it, and you could get everything. All the processes, they all trace back to hydrogen gas, they all trace back to, to this, and this of course goes deeper, because you've got transverse binding energy. Oh, I haven't even talked about the neutrino shadow. Okay, so these two solid metallic hydrogen spheres, counter-rotating spheres that create this focal pinch point, that create the, the gravity point, they induce a neutrino shadow, and that neutrino shadow is kind of like a workshop. So eventually, uh, if this video makes it that far into the future, where we can play with solid metallic hydrogen, we can now play with neutrino shadowing effects. Neutrino shadowing effects are very odd because you can now do things you couldn't do in the outside universe. You're essentially creating a protected laboratory space where you can create ultra high compression and you induce, <laughs> you, you, you might like this part. It's not just a neutrino shadow, it's a neutrino vacuum. So this area here, inside here, inside this shell, this area, induces a neutrino vacuum. Please comment, please feel free to come forward with your questions because the more questions you have, the better I'm gonna be able to answer them. That's, that's pretty much it. It's, it's all kind of rattling around up here and, and besides, Today, it's probably not the best day for me to do videos, but it is. Today is a great day. August 1st, 2022 is the day, is the day 
that this made it out of my head and into yours. So, I know it's big, I know it's gonna change everything about the world again, but what part of the world? You know, what, what can we learn from this? Well, like I said, there's, there's products, product ideas, you can now understand how to make some new stuff, like somebody is gonna grow a giant electron. They're gonna make a giant electron using lasers of a particular frequency and a, an electron trap that can hold it in place and, and focusing superconductive lenses that are super cool, they're gonna have this cool chamber stuff. There's gonna be lots of cool stuff that come from this. And that's being able to understand what's going on beneath. I mean, there's a bunch of unpublished books that super scientists and think tanks and people like that, they use to try to get to the next generation of fusion and all this other thing. But what if fusion is not as cool as growing giant electron? I think that's, I think growing giant electrons is even cooler. So, uh, <laughs> current unification theory, what, what more can I say other than uh, my brain's tired. That, that's, I can say that. I mean, I've worked on this. Uh, this is a product of, uh, wow, we go back 30 years? Yeah, 30 years. No, no, it goes back to the beginning because that's when I first started studying physics, science and stuff. Thank you for watching. Thumb it a like. Thumb it a just, I just, just thumb it and, 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 and ask me some questions so I can talk more about this. Let's talk more about it. I'm going to leave this up for maybe as long as I can, maybe a week or so. But I've got other things that are in the pan, so I've got to, I've got to continue on, and who knows, this might not even last the day. So I'm going to post it and leave it up there and see if you all like it. All right, talk to you later. Bye.